Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is The Norman Invasion, Part 22, The North. So far in the series we have seen the Normans take Leinster, Meath, Munster and Connacht. In this episode they will push far into the north and northwest. There they will come up against one of the greatest powers in medieval Ireland, the kingdom of Tyrone and its ruling families, the O'Neills and their cousins, the McLaughlins. In this episode, the Normans have to navigate a complex web of deceit and murder steeped in tradition. So, before we begin with the Norman onslaught of the north, we need to take a close look at Western Ulster in particular, its ruling families and recap on their fortunes during the early days of the invasion. I have mentioned a few bits and pieces of this story in several shows so far. If you want to get a good background, I'd recommend checking out episode 17 of the series. Although, if you want to dive right in, this episode does recap all the major events. The province of Ulster stretches across the northern quarter of Ireland. It's a territory with flat eastern plains surrounding Loch Ney, which then rises into more mountainous terrain in the Spurn and Bluestack Mountains which tower over the Atlantic Ocean in the west. In the Middle Ages, Ulster had few towns, Armagh in the east being the only one of note. All roads in the north in the medieval period led to one place, the Kingdom of Tyrone, nestled between the Spurn and Bluestack Mountains in western Ulster. From there, the ruling dynasties, the O'Neill and McLaughlin families, dominated not only Tyrone, but also, more often than not, the minor kingdoms in eastern Ulster as well. While other families in Ireland had long lineages that stretched back into the distant past, none could hold a candle to the O'Neills or the McLaughlins. They had dominated politics in Ireland on and off for nearly seven centuries by the time the Normans landed in the late 1160s. The O'Neills and McLaughlins, rivals for the throne of Tyrone, actually shared a common ancestry, both springing from the one great family that had provided numerous high kings, the ancient Northern O'Neills. Way back at the dawn of Irish history, they, like many families in the north, had descended from a king, Niall of the Nine Hostages. They had remained unified as late as the mid-11th century, when they split in a bloody feud. One branch retained the name O'Neill, while another faction, descendants of a certain Lachlan O'Neill, called themselves McLaughlin or sons of Lachlan. Having once been so close, the feud between these two families to dominate Tyrone was more intense than perhaps any other in Ireland, and this would be crucial in how the Norman invasion of the North played out. Both the O'Neills and McLaughlins felt they had the right to become kings of Tyrone, and all that came with it. Most importantly, the chance to dominate Ireland. In a world where family history meant everything, Fathers and brothers were murdered in this feud, and with each passing generation, the struggle between these families intensified, fueled by blood and insatiable hatred. However, in the twilight years of the 11th century, finally it seemed that the McLaughlins were winning out. The O'Neills, a family name that had rang through the chapters of history for hundreds of years, disappeared from the annals and chronicles by 1090. In the following decades, the McLaughlins dominated Ulster and the Kingdom of Tyrone emerged as one of the major powers in Ireland. By 1156, on the eve of the Norman invasion, Murkertuk McLaughlin became the High King of Ireland. However, during his reign, a shadowy figure, who would play an important role in our story, returned to Tyrone, claiming to be a descendant of the O'Neills who had been vanquished seven decades earlier. Who this man was for sure, no one knows, but he was dubbed A. the Lazy Youth O'Neill. This name was given to him not because he was lazy, but because he refused to stand and acknowledge Murkertuk McLaughlin as his king. Dubious ancestry or not, it was clear this man, the so-called Lazy Youth, was raising the O'Neill standard again. In 1166, the King of Tyrone, Murkertuk McLaughlin, was assassinated by his Ulster vassals, and this set in train a series of events which triggered the Norman invasion. His main rival, Rory O'Connor, the King of Connacht, became High King, and he in turn attacked those who had been McLaughlin's allies, and in particular one man, Dermot MacMurrah, the King of Leinster, who he forced into exile. 
McMurrah sought Norman help, and the rest, as they say, is history. Within four years, Strongbow had landed in Waterford with his army. However, this was not the only outcome of McLaughlin's assassination. Chaos reigned in Ulster, and eventually Rory O'Connor, the High King, had to intervene. He appointed A, the lazy youth O'Neill, as ruler of half of Tyrone, and gave the other half to the McLaughlins. While this kept the North divided and weak, it primed what had once been the most powerful region in Ireland for a civil war just on the eve of the Norman invasion. While Strongbow successfully landed in 1170 to be followed by King Henry II in 1171, A. O'Neill, having risen from obscurity, found himself ruling over a large swathe of a divided north. Having raised the O'Neill banner, he naturally faced staunch opposition from the McLaughlins. However dangerous as this was, he and all the people of Tyrone were spared the horrors which Gaelic kingdoms further south suffered as the Normans sacked towns and burned settlements as they advanced across the southeast. That said, the Northerners were involved in one major battle against the Normans in the early years of the invasion. In 1174, Rory O'Connor, the King of Connacht, was planning a major raid on the Norman territory of Meath and he asked A. O'Neill for support. Given he had put A in power after the death of Murkertuck McLaughlin, this was an offer he could not refuse. In a symbol of his growing power, A. the lazy youth reputedly brought an army of 3,000 men south for an attack that ultimately failed in its objectives. This was, however, the first but not the last time the O'Neills would cross swords with the Normans. At home, the Kingdom of Tyrone remained divided. Indeed, were it not for their geographic isolation in the far north, the Normans would surely have taken advantage of the division between the McLaughlins and the O'Neills. Between 1170 and 1177, A. O'Neill and no less than three different sons of the McLaughlin family at one time or another all claimed they were kings of Tyrone. Turmoil was sweeping the region and in 1177, somewhat inevitably, A. the lazy youth O'Neill was killed by one of the McLaughlins. Unsurprisingly, the murderer's son, who had been present at the attack, was killed by the O'Neills in retribution. This year, 1177 proved to be decisive for the north of Ireland in other respects as well. While the McLaughlins and the O'Neills were locked in their century-old struggle, a new man, completely unknown to the arena of Ulster politics, whose family had never played any major part, turned up and suddenly became the greatest threat to both the McLaughlins and the O'Neills. This man was John de Courcy, a 21-year-old Norman knight. During their bloody feud to dominate Tyrone in 1177, the O'Neills and McLaughlins had taken their eye off the ball and John de Courcy had led the first Norman invasion of the north, shaving off a coastal strip in the east of Ulster. While this was outside the borders of the Kingdom of Tyrone, the O'Neills and McLaughlins needed to respond because de Courcy had just taken lands in what was their sphere of influence. They did not necessarily care if de Courcy deposed the existing rulers of eastern Ulster. They were just another Gaelic family who the rulers of Tyrone had suppressed for centuries. However, the arrival of the Normans into what the O'Neills and the McLaughlins saw as their extended realms posed a major threat. For that reason, they did fight de Courcy, but it was to no avail. In the following years, the Norman could not be dislodged and a colony took hold in eastern Ulster, about two days' ride from Tyrone. If you want to hear the full story of the establishment of this colony, check out part 17 of the series. By 1185, the leading Norman in Ulster, John de Courcy, had gone from strength to strength. He had married a woman called Afric, who was a princess in the royal house of the Isle of Man, a strategically placed island in the Irish Sea. This gave him allies in the region. It was increasingly obvious as well that de Courcy's ambition knew no bounds. He began to call himself the Prince of Ulster and minted his own coins. By the late 1180s, he was even appointed Justiciar of Ireland, that is, the King's representative. Partly through their own infighting and partly due to de Courcy's skill and luck, the Kings of Tyrone found their dominance in Ulster now severely challenged. The Norman conquest was unquestionably underway. While the Normans successfully established a colony in eastern Ulster in 1177, 
they did not push westwards towards Chiron in the following years. Instead, it appears they focused on solidifying what they already held. Something of an uneasy peace was established between the Normans and the McLaughlins, who had come to power after they assassinated A. O'Neill. Indeed, there was only one major attempt to expand when a Norman army did raid Tyrone in 1188. This Norman foray, however, was disastrous and the army suffered a heavy defeat. The Gaelic victory was costly because the ruling king, Donald MacLachlan, was struck by a spear and died on the battlefield. However, while there may only have been limited conflict after de Courcy arrived in 1177, this did change dramatically by the late 1190s. Across Ireland, that decade witnessed a massive wave of Norman expansion and Ulster was no different. Initially, the early 1190s was strangely quiet in Ulster. While the Normans advanced in Munster and began to eye up Connacht, the North remained as it had over the previous years. There was little evidence of strife between de Courcy's Normans and the Gaelic Irish of Tyrone. Likewise, and somewhat strangely, the O'Neills and McLaughlins were also unusually peaceful. There was not a single assassination recorded in the first six years of the 1190s. This, however, was just the calm before the storm. The peace between de Courcy and the Gaelic Irish of Tyrone may have been related to internal tensions within the Normans themselves. In 1191, Prince John, the Lord of Ireland and brother to King Richard, the Lionheart, rose in revolt against the King. In Ireland, John de Courcy firmly backed Richard the Lionheart against Prince John, which kept him busy. Ireland was full of Norman barons potentially supportive of the rebellious prince. For example, Theobald Walter and William Burke, amongst others, owed their position to Prince John, so de Courcy had to ensure their loyalty, which distracted him from Ulster. However, the peace that reigned between the Gaelic Irish and the Normans in the province began to change in 1196, when a series of factors collided to create a perfect storm. The first major event that took place that year was the somewhat predictable assassination of the then King of Tyrone, Murkutuk MacLachlan. This was carried out, unsurprisingly, by members of his own dynasty. The instability that followed this murder may have been the reason that prompted John de Courcy, who was now somewhat freed up, to try and initiate a second wave of conquests, pushing west from his base along the coast of Antrim. Up to this point, he had not really moved past the River Ban, but now, in 1196, he formed an alliance with some of the local Gaelic Irish and invaded Tyrone again. Nevertheless, despite the internal problems, de Courcy, like he had been on his previous attempt, was defeated. However, this was just the opening salvo in what was going to be a head-on assault into the heartland of O'Neill and McLaughlin power. The following year of 1197, de Courcy took a more strategic approach. He built a castle at Mount Sandal from where he could attack across the River Ban into Tyrone. He also took control of the barony of Keenocht on the north coast, which saw him encroach further and further into O'Neill and McLaughlin's sphere of influence there was no mistaking what his intentions from here on were. However, he did face stiff resistance in Tyrone, and a Norman raiding party that pushed as far west as Derry that summer was cut to pieces. But again, the price of this victory was high when yet another king of Tyrone was killed. Now what seemed to be an increasingly poisoned chalice of the kingship of Tyrone and the wider north passed into the hands of a very important figure, A. O'Neill II, the son of the king known as the Lazy Youth. This man would prove to be one of the greatest Gaelic kings of the later Middle Ages. A's first major test came two years later when de Courcy launched what was effectively open war in Tyrone, invading as far west as Derry. There he set up camp and began devastating the surrounding countryside. The full brunt of the Norman invasion was being brought to bear now on the north. However, A. O'Neill and the people of Tyrone proved much more aggressive than most Gaelic kingdoms in their resistance. De Courcy soon discovered that any penetration into what had been one of the oldest Gaelic kingdoms would be fought by any means necessary. A. O'Neill was aware of the Norman advantage in terms of armour, mobility and tactics on the open battlefield and was not lured into open combat. Instead, while de Courcy was attacking his heartland of Tyrone, he sailed around the coast and in response attacked the Norman settlement of Larne. 
even though a heavy battle ensued, O'Neill emerged victorious and successfully retreated to his ships, only suffering five casualties. Once de Courcy heard, he immediately had to withdraw from Tyrone to defend his territories, having learned a costly lesson. That was that while he may have the upper hand on the battlefield, the O'Neills had learned from other Gaelic kings' experiences of Norman attack. The conquest of Tyrone, if it was to ever be achieved, would clearly now be hard fought. John de Courcy had a major fight on his hands. However, if this Norman leader, John de Courcy, was anything, he was a gambler, a risk taker and at times stupidly brave. He would not be deterred by minor defeats and in 1200 he invaded Tyrone again where he suffered yet another defeat. These victories by the O'Neills and before them the McLaughlins were impressive. While suffering defeats along the way they had nevertheless overcome Norman armies in 1188, 1196, 1197 and now in 1200. Tyrone was emerging as the only Gaelic kingdom able to hold their own against Norman incursion. In the early years of the 1200s, it was clear that the situation in the north was approaching a stalemate. De Courcy could not overcome A. O'Neill, and O'Neill himself seemed unable or unwilling to launch an offensive against the Normans on his doorstep. This led the two to increasingly expand their influence in other directions outside Ulster. However, very quickly, both realised that their rule and power was much more fragile than they might have imagined. After the break, we will first see how the O'Neills fared when they meddled in the ongoing civil war in Connacht. Having enjoyed great success over the Normans in eastern Ulster, A. O'Neill II began to grow increasingly competent, and in 1201, when he was presented with an opportunity to expand his power, he grasped it with both hands. As we saw in the last show, the O'Connors in Connacht were increasingly embroiled in a full-scale civil war in the declining years of the 12th century, and several Norman lords, including John de Courcy, were trying to take advantage by backing one side or the other. Now in 1201, one of the main contenders, Cahill of the Red Hand O'Connor, having been defeated in a recent battle, arrived in Tyrone, seeking aid from A. O'Neill to restore him to power. This was an ideal chance for A to become something of a high king. If he could install Cahill O'Connor on the throne of Connacht, he would then have the allegiance of one of the most powerful kings on the island. In the summer of 1201, he gathered his forces and poured over the border into Connacht to his south. However, while he may have been a good battle commander in Ulster, A had totally misjudged this situation. He seems to have been unaware that William Burke, the powerful Norman lord, was backing the, the opposing O'Connor contender for the throne. A sought to retreat, but the mission ended in utter disaster. He and his army were trapped by Burke and were forced to submit to the rival O'Connors. This was totally humiliating, given the potential the campaign had originally offered. This blow now served to encourage A's enemies at home, and shortly afterwards his humiliation was complete, when he was temporarily deposed by the McLaughlins. While he did take power by the year's end, this had served to remind him his rule was fragile at best, and one step in the wrong direction could cost him everything. While this kind of internal squabbling between factions in Tyrone had proved decisive in all other major Gaelic kingdoms and had only served to aid the Norman advance. At this time, the Normans themselves were increasingly divided. In 1201, the first really serious feud amongst their ranks in Ireland broke out and John de Courcy was at the heart of it. Indeed, such was the magnitude of this feud that it dramatically changed the dynamics of the Norman invasion of Ulster. Even in the late Middle Ages, Europe at least, was increasingly networked and events in far-flung places had large impacts across the continent. In 1199, an assassination in northern France had a major impact on John de Courcy and indeed Ulster for decades to come, arguably. That year, at a minor siege at chaloux chabrol in Limoges in western France, King Richard the Lionheart was struck by a crossbow bolt. While military technology was developing, with each passing decade, the same cannot be said for the medical profession. The king was treated by a doctor known as the Butcher, and this man, who had earned his name well, unsurprisingly 
could not heal the wound, which festered, and the king died not long afterwards. Now having no heirs, King Richard the Lionheart was succeeded by none other than his younger brother, the very man who had rebelled against him only a few years earlier, Prince John. This was deeply worrying for John de Courcy. Now you'll remember that de Courcy had actively opposed Prince John in his rebellion, and now King John, one of the most vindictive men ever to sit the throne of England, was not likely to forget this. To make matters worse, John was massively paranoid, and de Courcy, a man who called himself the Prince of Ulster, was always going to attract his suspicions. What exactly triggered open animosity is not clear, but things began to go downhill dramatically in the early years of the 13th century, when de Courcy was embroiled in a controversy in Ireland. In 1201, just like A. O'Neill, John de Courcy had tried to get involved in the civil war in Connacht, where he too was actually defeated. You can hear the full background to this in the last episode. His intervention had not been sanctioned, however, and when he arrived back in the Norman colony of Meath, he was initially arrested and imprisoned by Hugh de Lacy, the younger brother of Walter de Lacy, the then Lord of Meath. These were the sons of the original Hugh de Lacy, who was mentioned in previous shows. You might remember him for his burned face. Anyway, back in 1201, de Courcy's arrest led to escalating tensions between the two Norman families. Indeed, de Courcy loyalists in Ulster began raiding de Lacy's territory in Meath, and eventually a shaky compromise was worked out, and de Courcy was released. This, however, triggered bad relations with the de Lacy family. To make matters worse, after these events, John de Courcy was summoned to court in England by King John. However, he refused to travel to meet the king, probably in fear that he would be stripped of his lands. But this was a highly dangerous move. It didn't bode well for the future. John de Courcy now increasingly faced an aggressive de Lacy family in Ireland and he had fallen foul of a king who already distrusted him. It didn't take long then before the de Lacy's and King John found common cause. It seems the king gave Hugh de Lacy, the younger brother of the Lord of Meath, a green light to attack the Norman colony in Ulster and specifically John de Courcy. In 1203, backed by his powerful brother, Hugh de Lacy invaded John de Courcy, who had been so instrumental in forging the Norman colony, was enraged and mobilised his army. The two forces met in full battle at Downpatrick, where de Lacy emerged victorious and de Courcy was driven from Ulster temporarily. While the Normans in Ulster were in total disarray, this obviously presented A. O'Neill, the King of Tyrone, an opportunity. However, he was embroiled in his own similar problems. That very year of 1203, the latest round of internal feuding saw the McLaughlins try to depose him as they had done his father. While A defeated them, he was in no position to take advantage of the Norman weakness. By 1204, John de Courcy had returned to Ulster, but he faced a renewed attack from Hugh de Lacy. In another battle, de Lacy defeated him again and took the self-styled Prince of Ulster captive. The conditions of his release this time were hefty. De Courcy had to leave Ireland, take the cross and travel to Jerusalem on crusade. This was a crunch decision. If John de Courcy left Ireland, he would probably lose everything. Hugh de Lacy was clearly eyeing up his lands and if he was absent for what would probably be years, when he returned, who knows what would have happened. While he did pledge to go on crusade, once he was released, he returned to Ulster. However, his enemies now began to circle. In 1204, De Courcy was again summoned to court by King John and the rift deepened when he refused to attend. This was pretty understandable by 1204. King John was gaining a notorious reputation. His nephew Arthur, the only potential rival claimant to the throne, had fallen into John's hands earlier in the year and had since disappeared. The same fate could easily befall John de Courcy. However, he could not withstand two powerful enemies in the king on one side and the Lacy brothers on the other, and in 1205 he finally decided to go to England and face King John. But so too did his great rival, Hugh de Lacy. The king did not actually lift a finger to touch the Courcy, but he did pretty much everything else he could to hurt him. He took all his lands in Ulster away from him and gave them to Hugh de Lacy, his rival, and appointed him Earl of Ulster. 
In terms of politics in the north of Ireland, this was a massive deal. The man who had been the driving force in terms of the colony now was, effectively, no more. For the potential expansion of the Norman presence in Ulster, it was also significant. Hugh de Lacey was a powerful young man in his own right, but he was also a brother to the most powerful Norman in Ireland, Walter de Lacey, the Lord of Mead. John de Courcy, a man who had once called himself the Prince of Ulster, having established the Norman colony there, was left with nothing. Embittered, he decided he was not going to give up easily and refused to accept King John's ruling and went into rebellion. For this, he lost all his lands in England as well. While he had always been a gambler, the stakes against de Courcy this time were enormous. His brother-in-law, the King of the Isle of Man, did give him a fleet of 100 ships, but he was easily repulsed when he attempted to invade Ulster. With little option, John de Courcy now fled to what is a pretty unexpected place. Perhaps the only place, though, he knew King John could not touch him. That was the Kingdom of Tyrone and his one-time enemy, A. O'Neill. When he turned up, he no doubt raised a few eyebrows. Only a few years ago, this guy had been raiding the Kingdom of Tyrone. But as they say, all's fair in love and war, and A. O'Neill was a man who knew what it was like to lose everything. He could surely empathise with de Courcy's plight. More importantly, though, O'Neill was growing increasingly powerful and there was no better way for him to prove his stature than to have his one-time Norman enemy come to him begging for protection. And so it was John de Courcy spent the winter of 1205 in Tyrone. A. O'Neill was also probably pretty happy to have a man who could potentially start a civil war amongst the Normans in Ulster, close at hand. The arrival of de Courcy in Tyrone and the appointment of Hugh de Lacey as Earl of Ulster brought to an end the first wave of conquest in the north. Impressively and uniquely, the O'Neills and McLaughlins had survived unlike any other family in Gaelic Ireland. Their lands were more or less left untouched and they had inflicted several serious defeats on the Normans. They had established themselves as a force to be reckoned with going forward. Gaelic Ireland may have been down, but it was not out. In the next show, I am going to turn to the conquered lands and take a look at how the Normans were transforming their new territories in Ireland. For this, I am going to focus on what was the Kingdom of Ossory which became the Norman County of Kilkenny. After that show, we will have completed our look at all areas of Ireland in the 1190s and we will push on with our story of the invasion as it developed into the 13th century. Until then, Sloan.